Hi besties, welcome to an all new episode of the Bro Girl Experience. I'm your host friend. Today is a historical contribution to the podcast and we are going to be covering the strange disappearance of Mrs. Amelia Earhart. If you didn't know, I cover two different topics on my channel and this topic hits both of them. I like to talk about the most inspiring women in history as well as just different historical events. So without further ado, if you want to know what happened to Amelia, just keep watching. Amelia Earhart was born on July 24th. 24th, 1897 in Atchison, Kansas. She was born to Alfred Otis Earhart and Amelia Otis Earhart. From a very early age, Amelia showed a lot of interest in aviation, strangely enough. This was not usually a female topic at the time. This was something that was more encouraged among males, um, but Amelia just showed a extreme interest in learning how to fly planes. So she referred to as a tomboy growing up because some of her favorite hobbies included things which were not considered ladylike in the early 90s. 1900s, such as climbing trees, hunting, and collecting bugs and frogs on adventures with her sister. When she was seven years old, Amelia made her own roller coaster with the help of her uncle and sister by attaching a homemade ramp to the roof of their family's tool shed. Despite crashing spectacularly, it didn't frighten Amelia, who told her sister that it was just like flying. When she and a friend visited a flying exhibition in Toronto, Canada, the pilot flew low over their heads, and instead of running, Amelia stood her ground and she felt herself being called to a career in aviation, saying, I did not understand it at the time, but I believe that little red airplane said something to me as it switched by so she was very adventurous and curious as a child and she spent a lot of her time outdoors um, and this is when she started to actually pursue her passion of aviation she attended an all-girls school in pennsylvania but in 1916 during world war one she had to put this on hold um, because she dedicated herself to nursing wounded soldiers she volunteered in a canadian military hospital and this is where she first started to realize that she had a strong sense of courage adventure she wanted to help the world she wanted to advance the world and this is kind of where all of these discoveries were rooted after the war she headed on over to america and she attended columbia university in new york city and she studied pre-med so she went to school for pre-med but it wasn't long till she realized that she was really getting that pull back from wanting to study aviation so she did just that and in 1920 she took her first flight with frank hawks who was a world war one pilot and this experience really just drew her over the edge she was like no i am becoming a pilot after this this is my one dream in life 1920 was a haven for pilots it was full of barnstormers pilots who stunted in air circuses and gave rides to often terrified passengers in december of 1920 amelia and her father went to an air rodeo in long beach where pilots performed spins loops and dives amid a crowd of spectators the next day edwin paid ten dollars to give his daughter her first passenger flight a 10 minute ride over the hollywood hills the moment the plane left the ground, she knew that she herself had to fly. It was at that moment that she knew she had found her calling. She began flying lessons in California, um, and within six months, she actually purchased her first plane. It was a bright yellow biplane named the Canary. And in 1923, she became the 16th woman in the world to earn a pilot's license from the Federation Aeronautique Internationale, also known as FAI. She dedicated so much of her life to aviation that she started to get noticed by her fellow aviators. She was in invited to join the friendship crew for a transatlantic flight um, in 1928. This is when she really broke out in her career because this flight received a lot of media attention. So although she wasn't actually flying the plane, her inclusion in the project really brought light to her name and people started to know who she was in aviation. That same year, she set the women's altitude record by reaching 14,000 feet in the Canary. After the financial crisis in the 1920s, money was tight and she had to sell the canary and took up work as a teacher and a social worker. During this time, she was still passionate about aviation and wrote several newspaper columns championing women aviators. Around this time, she got a call at work from a Captain Hilton H. Rayleigh who asked her a simple question that would change her life. Would you like to fly the Atlantic? She was only to be a passenger on the flight, but it still made her the first woman passenger to fly across the Atlantic. The plane landed in Southampton Water in England. The locals gave her a rousing reception, and the mayor of Southampton, who was also a woman, congratulated her heartily. In a later interview, Earhart said, Started old flying? Had to. I was just baggage, like a sack of potatoes. Maybe someday I'll try it alone. Returning to America, she was hailed as the Queen of the Air by newspapers. She became associate editor at Cosmopolitan and had a number of celebrity endorsements for many products, including clothes and luggage, and of course, commercial flying. She now pushed for an untarnished record of flying achievements of her own. 
This is when she turned into a real bad bitch. And by 1932, she became the first woman to fly across the Atlantic. And this is when she received worldwide fame. She also hit several different records in her journey. She then went on to set another record, which was the first solo flight across the Pacific in 1935. Not only was she making such strides in the aviation field, but women in general were very heavily influenced by her. She was setting so many records, but coupling that with being a woman, people that were just interested in her life and her career. She was a huge advocate for gender equality. She constantly wanted to question gender roles. She wanted to influence other women to take uh, more of a front foot in aviation. And this is when the climax of our story is reached. So she wanted to reach a new milestone. Um, and in 1937, she embarked on her most ambitious flight yet. She wanted to circumnavigate the globe. She did so with her navigator, Fred Noonan. And a lot of it was successful. And when she reached her final leg of the flight, her and Fred actually went missing. Lost. In 1937, she made her first attempt at flying around the globe. She and her co-pilot, Fred Noonan, flew to Hawaii from Oakland, but stopped due to technical difficulties. But Earhart refused to give up. She tried again a few months later after her airplane, a Lockheed Electra, sponsored by Purdue University, was prepared. This time, they flew in the opposite direction, heading from Miami over Africa, India, and South Asia. They made it a total of 22,000 miles but the remaining 7,000 miles had to be flown over a precarious expanse of the Pacific Ocean, and the plane disappeared just 800 miles in. So the flight plan. Um, her journey was part of an attempt to fly around the world, um, and then on July 2nd, 1937, her and Noonan were flying a Lockheed Model 10 Electra aircraft, and the next destination was Howland Island in the Pacific. The last confirmed radio transmission occurred at 8.43 a.m. on July 2nd, 1937, uh, she reported that they were low on fuel and couldn't find Howland Island. And this is when her and Fred just completely vanished off the face of the earth, literally. The U.S. Navy started to look for her and they actually conducted one of the largest searches in history. They covered 250,000 square miles of the Central Pacific. Uh, but again, they, were, they could not find any wreckage from the airplane. There are several different theories on where they actually landed. Some people think that they landed on the Nikumaroro of Nikumaroro in the Western Pacific Ocean to finally answer the question, what really happened to Amelia Earhart? The plane is a Lockheed Electra, the last known of its kind. It's also the same plane that Amelia Earhart was flying when she vanished in July of 1937. Joining Allison Fundus in the expedition was Dr. Bob Ballard, the famed explorer who found the wreck of the Titanic. Ballard and his team believe this photo of Nikomororo Island, taken by a British soldier a few months after Earhart disappeared, could provide the key. If you enhance the small little blurry piece that, that we were looking at, you, you can make it out to be what could be landing gear of a Lockheed Electra, which she was flying at the time. If that was the landing gear, these scientists believe Amelia Earhart's plane could be lying on the bottom of the ocean off the coast of Nikomororo Island. And then some people think that they were captured by the Japanese and taken prisoner. However, again, there is no evidence to suggest either of these claims. Um, the circumstances surrounding their disappearance is still highly speculated today, unfortunately. No concrete evidence has ever really been found on if they landed, if they were captured, if they crashed, so on and so forth. Um, but what does remain is her legacy on aviation and women, women empowerment as a whole. She really left a mark with women in the sense of teaching people to follow their dreams. There was not many people like her beforehand, so she paved the way for many women to start engaging in aviation and break similar records and try and have such a strong footprint on the flying world in general. Uh, the community has rallied around her family. They have organized vigils, spread awareness about her disappearance through social media and news outlets. It was very prominent in the public eye, but there is the forever unexplained absence of Amelia and Fred. And as I normally do, I want to open it up for discussion. What do you guys think happened to her? Um, where do you think they landed? Do you have any additional theories or evidence you want to add down below? Uh, but that is actually it for today's episode of the Broke Girl Experience. I hope you enjoyed this small little bite of history. And I hope you'll like, comment, and subscribe if you like my videos. But on that note, I will see you next week for an all new episode of the Broke Girl Experience.